Let's stand, sing the chorus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Hymn number 366, I Surrender All. Ladies Fellowship, there will be a delayed Christmas party at 6 p.m. on January the 11th. You can bring an exchange gift for that. The Senior Food Box Program will be January the 12th, um, and we will need extra hands for that. So anybody that can turn out for that and help a little bit, please do that. And then just a reminder that today is our first Sunday Fellowship, and there won't be p.m. services tonight. 
but please do stay and enjoy um, the fellowship today. Hymn number 372. Hymn number 372.
if you would stand, hymn number one, 518. Hymn number 518, this is our offertory hymn. <clears throat> Number 373, Where He Leads Me. Thank you. 
because I was thinking the last few days, uh, because I hadn't uh, done the music for January yet, uh, I started praying about what hymns to sing and and uh, as we start out the new year and and then uh, as I was thinking about special music, this song kept coming to my to the top of my head. And it's a song that I've sang a dozen times at least, uh, The Anchor Holds. But if we think about 2022, we think about the previous, not just 2021 and 2020, but there's been problems all the way back to the 1900s. But this, they've really been expounded, seems like here at our church the last couple of years. And so as you think of these last couple of years, the only way, the only way that we got through that is because the anchor holds. That's the only way that we will get through 2022 if we know who our anchor is and what it takes each and every day. The pastor challenged us here a week ago to go the extra mile. That's what we need to do in 2022. We need to go that extra mile. We need to do that one little thing more that we've been putting off. Whether it's at the church, whether it's at your work, whether it's at your home, just go that extra mile for the Lord. And remember, the only way that we will get through 2022 and be here again in a year is to let that anchor Hold us.
Thank you, Brother Randy. <clears throat> this morning, we're going to begin a new series. We'll be doing this for the next three or four Sundays. It's called In the Middle, and uh, it will become <clears throat> evident for you what all that uh, what all that means. But first of all, I want to just thank you for showing up this morning. We can use the weather as an excuse or anything as an excuse, but I want to thank you guys for being in your place, coming to the house of God on the first Sunday of the new year. We know that uh, it's been a challenge, this, especially the month of December, but we've turned the corner, we've turned the page, and we know that uh, God's got something special in store for Calvary Baptist Church. I believe that. Certainly, you believe that as well. We come to a, a very odd scripture text this morning. But as we do so, we want to draw some truths for, for us as we, as we begin this year. And uh, I think it'll become more evident as we, we get into the text. But uh, I just want to let you know that we're here this morning, whether the devil wants it or not. We're going to open up the Word of God. We're going to preach the very best we can. And we're going to leave the results up to the Lord. Amen? And that's the way that it ought to be. We're going to learn this morning about a man by the name of Solomon. And as many of you know, this uh, king started off well. He had a huge task ahead of him, taken over from the popular uh, king, his father David. And to Solomon's credit, as he begins to reign, he asks God for wisdom. He understood that the task that uh, he would be undertaking would be great, and I want, to note, I want you to notice what he said in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7. Now, we're just going to start here. It's not going to be our text verse, but we are going to start here this morning. 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 7. Mm -hmm. And now, O Lord, my God, Thou hast made Thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a child. 
I know not how to go out or to come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which have thou excuse me, which thou hast chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Give, th- give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge thy so great a people? And the and watch this. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. So we understand from the from the get go, Solomon is uh, steps up and he realizes his total dependence upon the Lord. Now we know this: life is too complicated, f- complicated for us without acknowledging the Lord's favor. So early on, Solomon was right on course. And like so many who start off well, they just simply don't finish well. Life takes its toll, so we seem like uh, as, as, as the older we get, the less we feel like that we need to depend upon God. So we try to do other things and cheap substitutes, and it's gotten us nowhere. So with all of that said... Solomon now has taken on the huge task of judging Israel being the king of Israel. Now, we just read in the Bible that he said this. The people are too great to even count. They're too great a multitude. So with that in mind, let me just give you this. He is now stepping into one of the most probably impossible situations that he could step into. He's following David. David was a very popular king. You know that. David died with died with wealth and riches and all of the favor of uh, of the people. Solomon is the new kid on the block, so now he's going to have to step into his David's David's shoes and do the very best. But here's what I've learned, and here's what you've learned: when you're the new kid on the block, you're going to be tested. When when you step into a new responsibility, whether it's at work or whether it's something brand new to you, you're going to be tested right off the bat. And Solomon is fixing to be tested. And matter of fact, in the way that he's fixing to be tested is one of the most illogical, in, in probably illogical things that he could be thrust into. There was there was no grand solution to this. And yet Solomon found a solution that relates to us today. As a matter of fact, it is, it is, it is a text verses that we're, we're going to look at. That when you see this, you're going to say, Preacher, how is that relatable to us? And how can we draw any strength or application from that? As we finish, we're going to show you how you can draw application because this sermon will build on the next several sermons. So I trust that you'll get this application and that you'll not soon forget it. Let's pray. Father, we need your divine strength and your enablement this morning because there's no way to preach a message like this without your divine favor. Father, we appreciate the the songs that's been sung, the special, the anchor holds, Father, if there is ever a truth that is needed today, it is that truth. Thank God that you still held us through 20 and 2021. And Father, we know because of, our, of your past performances, 2022, you'll still hold us in thy hand. And we thank you for that. Father, for the truths that we'll discover this morning, Lord, I just pray that you'll give us an insight that will help us and to... And to maybe cause us to think and to pause just a moment. Father, this morning, if we ever needed a strong uh, direction from the Lord Jesus Christ, it is today. If there's anything, Lord, that we could uh, tell you this morning is we need you in a, in a superhuman way. Father, I just ask that you'll be with each and every one of us in this room. And everyone that is listening through the Facebook Live. Father, certainly we don't know the needs that's out there for every life. But we do know the solution for every life. And that is Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray if there is someone listening to this message. 
Lord, if they do not have that assurance of salvation, that this day, Lord, they'll not let it pass without opening this brand new year and their heart to you. God, give us wisdom and insight. And Father, when we, when we close this day and we write the chapter of this, of this whole day, we can honestly say, Lord, it's been a day that the Lord has given us and we've done our very best. Father, please be with every heart and ear and foot and mind that will hear this message and bless them accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you learn this next vital truth, I want to ask you a question. When is the last time that you have experienced a real spiritual breakthrough? There could be something that you will learn that will set you free and awaken you for the start of this year. Remember, King Solomon is coming on as the new kid. And with that, we understand he's, people are going to look at him. They're going to test him right off the bat. And he was thrust into an impossible situation. And how he handled what he is fixing to be told would set the tone for the rest of his reign. Notice, if you will, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 16. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman says, O my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass... The third day that after I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. And there were together. There were no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And the woman's child died in the night, because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight, and took my son from beside me, while thy handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom." And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. Now, some of you can understand this, but one of the most tragic events in life is that of a death of a child. The scars that leaves behind can last a lifetime. Here we see two women with questionable past. Come to the new king for wisdom on a dead child. These two women will, with sorry reputations, tell the king a conflicting story. Each woman are claiming that the live child was hers. There's a dead child in the story and a living child. And li listen to this. And Solomon has to determine who the real mother was. Now this was before DNA evidence. King Solomon would have the final say on the matter. Now, without rehearsing this, because we do have an application for you this morning, it's this. The, 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 the lady that is telling this story made it abundantly clear. There was only two women in the house. Amen. There was two children in the house. Amen. At one point, both children were alive, but the Bible says she overlaid it. So one of the children evidently was smothered or, or, or something. The life was taken. So one of the women at the, at the, at, 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 in the nighttime hours switched child. Put the dead child with one woman and she took the other child. Now Solomon wasn't there. All Solomon heard was this wretched story. Now what makes this story so interesting is this. The women had a very questionable past. Did you see this? They were, they were prostitutes, so the women did not have a good reputation. Uh, as we said from the outset, <coughs> King Solomon was, was the new kid on the block. And so he hears this story, and no doubt he has to figure out who exactly is telling the truth, and how in the world is he going to figure out all of this situation because... He's not in the house. Are you following me so far? It seems like to me from the very beginning that Solomon had a no-win situation. 
Now, the, the, the application is this. You're going to find out here in a minute how, how this describes us and you and me. But what decisions led these women to place uh, to this situation? Now, here's the thing that, that, that garnered my attention as I was studying and restudying and restudying this text. How in the world, or, 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 by the way, are you still with me? How in the world did two harlots wind up in the same house? Now, now, now reach with me just a little bit. Act like you're interested. It would seem to me that it would be a whole lot more sensible if you're going to engage in that lifestyle to be by yourself. Come on, come on. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Because can I tell you, the in and out of this situation could not have been good. The Bible says that they were the harlots by trade. And, and can I tell you, if you're going to engage in that occupation, you're going to have all kinds of, let me just say it for a better word, of clientele. So there's no telling what in the world would come into their house and come into this situation. And can I tell you... It could not have been good. So all of this traffic coming in in this house, and uh, the, at this particular juncture, we learn in, in the story, in the setting, that how this happened, I don't know, but the two women had got impregnated, and now they have children, and basically, probably, they were ba- basically the same age. The children were the same age. So I, I'm saying this is just a sordid story in the Old Testament. And as you started reading this story, I have to ask myself this one question. Why in the world, what, watch this, why in the world is this story even included? Why do we even need to know this? Everything about their background is not good story. As a matter of fact, you would wonder why at the beginning of King Solomon's reign, is this story even needed? And how did... The, watch this. How did these two women end up in this occupation? How did they finally figure out that this is what they want to do? And, and I hate to say this. Or, or watch. How, how did these women figure out this is what they wanted to do for a living? Now, I don't know about you, but there are some things that you want to do for a living that you might not like. But can I tell you, this occupation might not be one of the top ones that you would choose. Amen. Amen. (coughs) We learned this in large part. You are where you are in your life based on decisions that you have made. So here's what we've learned. Somewhere along the way, these two women's life took a turn. We don't know how, but these two women's lives took a turn for the worst. And in their worst case scenario, these two worst case women ended up together. Look, if you will, David Jeremiah writes something about decisions that I thought was interesting, that I thought you and I needed to know. Look at the, I hope they're up there, Brother Chris, are they there? No. There we go. On your decisions, Pastor David Jeremiah writes this, your best decisions reflect your values. Your best decisions reflect your values. Now, let me just tell you this. If that's the case, can I tell you these two women... If, if, if it reflects your values, these two women are in the same situation. How, how is this even remotely possible? If you are a Christian, our everyday decisions should reflect that. If, if you claim to know Christ Jesus as Savior, you are to base your decisions on that and nothing else. Number two, your best decisions are birthed in prayer. Now, can I tell you, it's, it's doubted very seriously if these two particular women knew about 
probably proper prayer. Can I tell you? That's how you and I find out the will and the favor of God is when we get into a tight space and we figure out that we have to pray and lift our petitions up to a holy God. Number three, your best decisions will need wisdom from others. Now, church, listen to me. Listen to someone you trust. Godly people will have your best interest in mind. Now, can I tell you something that, that I've learned over the years? These two particular women, I doubt very seriously if they've asked for wisdom. I, I ask, however their life turned to this occupation, I doubt very seriously if they ask somebody this question, do you think I ought to engage in the life of harlotry? Do you, come on, now with me, j- j- smile at me, let me know you're here. Do you think that they asked that question? I, I doubt very seriously. Now, whatever forces move them that direction, I don't know. Was it a broken home? Was it a battered spouse? Was it whatever the situation was that moved them in that, low, that, that direction? I don't know. But can I tell you this? I'm going to tell you and me, if you're going to need direction and, and where you're going to be in 2022, I'm going to tell you sometimes you're going to need help from godly influences. You're going to need some wisdom. It's not that maybe you don't know but sometimes if we hear it from a different source. Parents, have you ever did this? Your kids are not going to listen to you. So they'll go ask somebody, somebody else. And guess what? They tell them the same thing that, they'll, that, that you've told them. But they're going to listen to them more than they listen to you. Did that ever happen to you? Sure, it's happened to you. And you'll say, you'll say something like this. Well, I told you that same thing. Well, I didn't hear that. I, I didn't hear you tell me that. It's not that you haven't told him. It's just that from a different source. That's how we as Christians ought to be. We ought to listen. We ought to ask wisdom. We ought to ask questions. If we're stuck in a situation, don't remain there. Be men and women enough to ask counsel for somebody, maybe that's already been there and done that. Look at the next one. Now, nobody likes this. Your best decisions take time. Spur-of-the-moment decisions are only guesses. That's what David Jeremiah writes. I like that. Spur-of-the-moment decisions are only guesses. Take time. Sleep on it. God may have other plans for you. That's right. If, if, if you're faced with a, with a tremendous decision, even today or even this next week, be careful about that. Don't just jump off on something like this. Make sure that you are settled. Make sure that it's right. Make sure that you have taken some time about this. And that way, my friend, you'll make some better decisions. Look at, uh, look at number five. Your best decisions are committed to God. Commit your thought processes to the Lord. He knows how to correct your path. In other words, something like this. Lord, I just pray this day or this week or this year that I commit my thoughts unto you. Now, wait a minute. I know that may be a novel thought to some, somebody, but think about this. If you want to make the right decisions, wouldn't it be a good idea to commit your thoughts to God? I, 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 I don't know, but I'm just thinking that if I, if I need His wisdom then I'm certainly going to have to have the proper thought processes on this. So I said all that to say this. Some of the things that we've just spoken about, these women had no clue about this. These two women were brought together, their paths, who knows why, how, and the situations, but they were brought together. And they bring this impossible situation to Solomon to figure out. You would be surprised even this last year, on some impossible situations that I've been placed in. Impossible situations that were that were really no win situations. Whether whether you went this way you're going to be wrong, come on, you 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 know what I'm talking about. Or or whether this way you are going to be wrong. 
So there are some impossible situations that you get into life. And here's what you have to understand. You have to understand that you trust that God is guiding everything that you do. Because if you try, look, watch. If you try to please men, you're always going to make somebody unhappy. So ultimately, you've got to be accountable to the Lord Jesus. Now, with all of that said, you're asking, so what, big deal, what's this got to do with me? Let's look at chapter 3, verse 22. (laughs) Chapter 3, verse number 22. And the other woman said, nay, but the living is my son. And the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus spoke before the king. Now watch this. Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but my son is dead, and the son is the living. And the king says, Circle this in your narrative here. Bring me a sword. Now, wait a minute. Let's hold off here, king. (coughs) King, we ask your opinion. What's this sword thing got to do with anything? Now, watch what he says. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king says, divide the living child in two. And give half to the one and half to the other. Now, wait, 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 wait. I may not understand everything in life, but I'm kind of getting a clue here. The the king says, I know how to fix this situation, right? What does he say? Bring me a sword, and I'm just going to lop the child in two. And so, so you women, I like this. So you women will quit bickering. We're going to give half to one and half to the other, and that's going to solve all the situations. Well, well, sort of king, that's not going to solve the situations because if we do it your way, I'm going to have a dead child. Now, now, here's where it gets a little tricky. King Solomon, guy supposed to take daddy's place, says bring a sword. Now watch this. And the king says, divide the living in two and half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose living child was unto the king. For her bowels yearned upon her son and says, watch this. O oh my Lord, give her the living child and in no way slay it. But the other says, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered, And said, give her the living child, and in no way slay it, for she is the mother thereof. Each woman claimed the living child, and each said it was the other's fault, and each had a stake in the outcome. And then the king does something that seems stupid. Verse 24, bring a sword. What's all that about? Look at verse 25. And the king says, divide it, the living, in two. And this is where everything changes. And this is where you come into the picture. Look at verse 26. Then spake the woman whose the living child was. Look what she tells King Solomon. Oh my Lord, give her the living child and always slay it. But the other says, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. The true mother spoke up and was willing to give her the, give the child up. One woman desired, one woman desired the whole, while the other was willing to settle for half. Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Let me ask you this. When it comes to your spiritual life, are you like these women? Are you rather have the whole or had you rather have the half? 
Are you willing just to get by on last year's scraps, little pieces here and there? Or beginning this year, are you going to challenge yourself for the whole? The modern church is easily filled by leftovers rather than feasting on God's table. I'm surprised how little it takes to amuse the average Christian. When you leave here this afternoon, some might not even have a spiritual thought until next weekend. Which means this, that you're satisfied with the half. Some in this room are desiring God to give us all, the whole. You see, one of those women says, I don't care if you kill the child as long as I have half. That's all I want. That's the refrain of the church today. I'm just satisfied with just getting a half. If all I can do is come on Sunday morning and get a half of a message, that's all I'm going to care about. Because I don't want anything else the rest of the week. Because it just, it just clouds my mind. And preacher, I've just got a whole lot more to worry about than the church. I've got more on my mind than just the spiritual applications and all of this. For you don't understand, preacher, it is just so complicated out there. And if I try to include God in all of my plans and all of my things that I'm worried about, then all it does is just messes my thoughts up. One woman wanted the half and one wanted the whole. What do you want? This brand new year, can you honestly say, Preacher, I am going to start out 2022 and I really desire all of God. We learned in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 2 in Sunday school that a steward ought to be faithful. Then it's funny that the Bible should even say that because that ought to be something that the Christian just should be. We should be faithful to all of the spiritual things that God has recognized that's beneficial for our life. As a matter of fact, can I tell you something just here recently? Gone to the doctor several times and here's what they said. If you want to get better, you take these little capsules... And it's going to make you better. So here's what I decided to do. I didn't check the doctor's wisdom because whatever was on that prescription, I just assumed that that was, come on, come on with me. I, I just assumed that that was good for me. So when I got that prescription, I didn't put it on the shelf and say, that is the most stupidest thing I believe I've ever seen. Now, why am I going to take that? So what I decided to do is I decided to just take that prescription one time on Sunday morning. Amen. And then, when I don't get well, I'm going to blame the doctor. Well, I still don't feel good. I still don't feel like I ought to be. I still don't feel like I, I well, That's the stupidest doctor I believe. I'm just going to have to change doctors. Is anybody listening? That is exactly our spiritual condition today. I'm not going to take the prescription that God has given to us because I ain't got time. Well, let's just be very blunt with you. If you're not going to take the this prescription that God has given to you, then you're not going to get well. You're going to stay right where you are with your same prejudices, your same sins, your same dramas, and everything that's floated from last year up to this year. And it will not ever be a change. Why? Because some will settle for half. And some will want the whole. Something that jumped out at me. And I want you to, if, if you can, go back to verse 26, and then I'll sum up. 
And verse number 26 is an interesting verse because this really popped out at me when I was looking at it and re-looking at it and re-looking at it. <clears throat> then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king. Now watch this. For her bowels. Look at this next word. Yearned. Did you notice that word yearn is a very interesting word? It means, listen to this, it means to be affected with passion. It means to be affected with passion. Would to God our churches would yearn for the presence and the power of God once again. Yearn for the, for the truth of the Word of God. Yearn for the passion that we used to have. The passion that would, would tears would run down our eyes when we thought about our lost kinfolks. Lost about, thought about our lost uh, co-workers. Listen, that's what we're talking about. This lady yearned for uh, the right decision. She was affected with passion. When is the last time that the church was even affected with passion? We're affected with passion over ball games. We're affected with passions over things that, listen, ha we're beyond our control. And it's not going to affect your life one way or the other. Let me ask you this. When is the last time you've had passion for Christ? How long have you simply settled for the half? Has that become your new normal? There was a time when you excited for the things of God. Church was special. You found many a blessing in the round God's people. You were fired up with miss a service, but over years, you simply become distant, cold, and in fact, out of touch spiritually. You no longer have the holy heartburn you used to carry to each service. You started settling for the half and not the whole. In a famous speech given by 65-year-old Winston Churchill... The Germans were about to invade England. The English was undermanned, ill-prepared, and poorly armed. The experts predicted Hitler's success and would take but a few weeks to, to annihilate England. The predictions of the experts would no doubt have come true if it had not been for the influence of Churchill's leadership. But I want you to hear what Winston Churchill had to say, and maybe we ought to adopt this same thing. Notice what he said. The battle of France is over, Churchill went on to say. I expect that the battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. The whole fury and might of the enemy must be soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us on this island or lose the war. Let us therefore brace ourselves to the duties. And so bear ourselves that. Listen to this. That if the British Empire and its commonwealth will last for a thousand years. Men will say. This was their finest hour. Through COVID. Through sickness through flu, through indifference, through the fading away of many churches, I would pray that some historian would write of Calvary Baptist Church, this was their finest hour. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we can come into this place. And, Father, that we would desire the whole and not the half. Lord, if there's any time in the history of our dear church to desire you and more of you, it is in 2022. Father, today would be a good day to get started in the right direction. Today would be a good day to do what we need to do to start this new year right. 
Father, I just pray that you would be with our hearts, our attitudes, our dramas, our filth, our sin. That, Father, we would cast all of that upon you. And start clean and fresh. May this be our finest hour. In Jesus' name, would you stand with me? Brother Randy.